Thanks for tuning in to Witch Wednesdays with Steph for a chat about a new witchcraft topic every Wednesday morning. Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. I'm Steph, and you are listening to episode 73, Charms, Amulets, and Talisman. And I want to say right off the bat that I don't know if it's talisman or talismans. I've seen it both ways. I looked it up, and talisman sounds better to me, but so that's what I'm going with in this episode, but I think both of them are fine for use, but If you know the answer, definitely reach out and let me know, but uh, just that's what I'm going with for this episode. So when we were talking about charms, amulets, and talisman, a lot of people use those terms interchangeably, and they are very similar, but I wanted to talk about what the actual difference is between the three, uh, even though they're very subtle, and then talk a little bit more about each one in depth and how to use them in your witchcraft practice. So in the simplest terms, to break it down, charms are worn to attract good luck, amulets protect from danger, and talisman attract a particular benefit or power to the owner. Let's start with lucky charms, because I think that's something that everyone is kind of familiar with even if you haven't used them specifically in your witchcraft practice, you definitely know of things like lucky socks and the four-leaf clover and things like that. So the word charm comes from the French term charme. I think I'm saying that right, but I never took French. So again, not sure. And that means an incantation or spell. Charms were originally spoken or sung. Eventually, people wanted something that was a little more permanent and tangible rather than just the words. So objects that had a special significance were used as a replacement for these spoken charms and anything that was sung. And when this first started, they were really like bones or remains from something that belonged to a saint or was associated with Jesus. That's when those things became really popular and considered lucky charms. And we still use the word charming in the way that it was originally intended. So when you say it's something like someone is so charming, you're describing them as being well-spoken and has a certain uh, charisma, uh, knows just the right words to say, something like that, that it's charming. And that goes back to that original meaning of the word as incantation that was spoken or sung. So coming back into the modern day, nowadays literally anything can be used as a charm. Again, lucky socks, lucky penny, or coin that was passed down from a family member. A lot of people use uh, St. Christopher medals in their uh, cars. That's a charm of good luck and also an amulet of protection for you know safety while traveling. And of course, one of the most well-known lucky charms is the four-leaf clover. And the Irish tradition for this says that one leaf is for fame and one is for wealth, and one is for a faithful lover, and one to bring you glorious health, all in the four-leaf clover. So those are what the four leaves mean, if you uh, were ever curious about that. There are a lot of other lucky charms that you may have seen. Uh, Fish are a very common symbol in the uh, Christian church, attributed to Jesus feeding the masses. The Ankh is an Egyptian symbol, of everlasting life and also provides good luck and wards off diseases. So that can be an amulet or a charm. And outside of the sort of religious aspects, the charm bracelet is very popular nowadays. So I think Pandora is very popular, you know, brand for it. And you get the charm bracelets and then attach each of the charms to the bracelet of different, you know, places that you've been or represent life milestones like the birth of a child or things like that and people give you different charms you know for mother's day or christmas or things like that just representing things that you've liked or places you've been and that is worn as sort of a lucky charm as well and a lot of people also collect things that are special to them that they use as charms rather than attach them to a bracelet that can be buttons or medals uh, anything of those sorts and 
they definitely don't have to be visible like the charm bracelet. They can be worn under clothing or carried in your pocket or purse or just carried in the vehicle. So lots of different ways to use Lucky Charms. And that's probably one of the most common, you know, mundane ones that people who are outside of witchcraft know about and actually use and don't even consider it witchcraft or don't think of that aspect of it. They just think Lucky Charm. Next up is the idea of amulets. People have been wearing amulets for thousands of years because early people did not understand the why of natural phenomenon, like lightning, earthquakes, you know, any sort of those natural occurrences that are really like strange and frightening if they don't know the science behind it that we know now. So they made amulets to protect themselves, their home, their families, crops, uh, livestock, all those things that were important. They used amulets to protect those things from things like lightning and earthquakes. In ancient times, and I'll explain not so ancient times, people believed that a person or animal could harm them by staring at them with an quote unquote evil eye. So there are remnants of from like over 5,000 years ago, clay tablets that were found to describe the damage that an evil eye can inflict. And people would carry amulets to protect them from this evil eye. So that is a very, very common symbol and has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And this is actually still a very common practice in some areas of the world. So you may have seen this. And I think in uh, certain stores and jewelry lines, they actually have the evil eye amulet protection. Um, you see that a lot. It's very common. I think uh, before the whole pandemic started, of course, I was walking through a Macy's and they had like a whole display section of evil eye um, jewelry, which was interesting to me. And they have lots of different, you know, amulets and things that you can wear. And it's very prominent in the hereditary Italian witchcraft that I talked about in the Pagan Paths episode, uh, Stragaria, I think it's called. And that is a very common belief in that system. And along with that is in the Italian system is the quote unquote devil horns. Uh, like if you uh, know the devil horn, like hand gesture that they use at heavy metal concerts, um, like Black Sabbath and things, uh, that is also comes from uh, Italian witchcraft as protective of the against the evil eye. And many people of Italian descent wear a charm. Um, similar to that to ward off the evil eye. So uh, if you've ever seen a lot of, if you watch a lot of Jersey Shore, they wear it. <laughs> but a lot of Italian Americans do, and Italians do wear um, the horn, sometimes just a single horn uh, on a gold chain to ward off the evil eye. I am of Italian and German descent, and I actually have one of those. One of my Italian um, relatives actually gave me one, the Italian you know, traditional horn, a single horn on a gold chain when I was a baby. So I've had it ever since. And these days, there are a lot of uh, amulets that are worn by those in particularly dangerous professions. Uh, the firefighters wear St. Florian, the patron saint of firefighters. Sailors wear St. Christopher. And police officers wear uh, St. Michael because those are their, you know, patron saints. Um, they wear a lot of you know, tattoos or medals or anything. Those are all powerful amulets of protection that have a relig religious aspect to them. And on the more folklore side of amulets, and folklore is more what my particular witchcraft practice um, is like, and to protect against you know, evil and catching evil spirits in a folklore, folklore tradition um, is the use of knots or macrame because knots are believed to catch evil spirits. And this is why aprons often have knots tied in them. And I'm not talking about just like where they fasten at the back. If you've ever um, seen your grandma's apron hanging up and it might have like a knot just somewhere in the... Um, 
fastening around the back or around the neck and it's not actually used to fasten there's just a random knot there that can't, they can't get it out that is part of Appalachian folklore to protect your kitchen magic so lots of different amulet options across the board to protect yourself and your home and your family all interesting and then the last one is talisman and talisman provide power or energy they are often made at times that are astrologically or spiritually significant. And astrologically, that might mean like your particular planetary or zodiac correspondences. Um, but it could be like a particular astrological event, like a meteor shower. So they can be stone, metal, or even just a piece of parchment paper. They may come from a more predatory animal like a bear claw or a shark's tooth or um, eagle feathers are very popular. And it's often believed that these talismen provide the wearer with some of the qualities of the animal that it came from. And in the same way as sort of lucky charms, you think like a lot of ball players have lucky hats or lucky shoes. Those hats and shoes can also be worn as a talisman because they may be associated with power. If the wearer believes that it's giving them a competitive edge over their opponents and not just luck, then that would be not only a lucky charm, but also a talisman. And in the realm of witchcraft, probably the six-pointed star is the most famous talisman. It's an upward pointing triangle that symbolizes fire, the sky, and male energy, and that's imposed over a downward pointing triangle that symbolizes water, earth, and female energy. It's also called the Star of David, it represents the nation of Israel and Jewish religion, and also is referred to as the Seal of Solomon, because it's believed that King Solomon also used this symbol. But along with the five-pointed star in witchcraft, the six-pointed star is also very common, and that is a talisman of power. Of course, as someone who loves crystals, I cannot end this episode without talking about using gemstones as talismans, charms, or amulets, because the use of gemstones as these things dates back thousands of years. Many soldiers of the Crusades carried stones that had runic images carved into them. Some carried bloodstones because it was ruled by the god of war, which is Mars, and soldiers believed that bloodstones would make them brave in battle and protect them from harm. So the history of using gemstones in this way dates back quite a while. Nowadays, wearing jewelry that's made of gemstones or particular metals are some of the easiest ways to wear charms, talisman, or amulets in a fairly discreet manner. And it's very common for people to like wear their birthstones and things like this that have completely nothing to do with witchcraft. So it's an ideal solution for broom closet witches who want to use you know, their, their gemstones or particular stones in this way and not have everybody know that it's a witchy reason for doing so. So the easiest way to choose which gemstones to use in this way um, is just, of course, see what calls to you. That's always what I recommend. I, certain stones just call to people, certain types of stones, certain colors, anything like that. Um, but if you are looking for something in particular to you know, sort of decide what the purpose of the gemstone is going to be used for, because all of those three options are different. One's, you know, power, protection, or luck. And once you can decide that, then there's better colors of stones um, that would be better for those situations. You can also use numerology to help you pick up a gemstone. And in order to do that, you would use your date of birth, or if you're you know, creating it for somebody else, you use their date of birth. But you take the sum of the month, day, and year, and then reduce it down to a single digit. So if you were born, you know, October, which would be 11, October 11th would be one plus one plus one plus one. And then whatever your birth year is, say it's 2000, then plus two. So that would equal six. And that is already a single digit. If you add up all of those digits, you know, say you were born in the 90s, then your number is quite a bit higher. Then you just keep adding. If you get like two numbers, like 24, then you would add the two together and that, you know, four plus two would be six. So you just keep going until you get a 
single digit, except there are considered two what are called master numbers. That is 11 and 22. So if you get those numbers, you do not need to reduce them down any further. You stop with that number. So each number then relates to a specific color, in which case you'd want to go find a gemstone in that color. And I am going to read you the list here, but as always, I have the show notes up on whichwednesdays.com and on Patreon. So if you are looking for something in particular or want to re-reference this information, it's always there for you. you know, list it out to make it a lot easier. So number one is the color red. Red stones relate to passion, enthusiasm, and energy. And examples of these stones are ruby, garnet, and red jasper. The number two is associated with orange. Orange stones relate to close relationships and personal satisfaction. Examples are citrine, carnelian, and orange sapphire. Number three is yellow. Yellow stones relate to expressing the you know, fun and joyful aspects of your life. Examples are yellow barrel and topaz. The number four is associated with green. Green stones relate to hard work and accomplishment. Examples are emerald, peridot, and tourmaline. The number five is associated with blue. And blue stones enhance clarity and perception and aid in goal setting. Examples are lapis lazuli, sapphire, and blue tourmaline. The number six is associated with indigo. Indigo stones relate to caring for others. Examples are sodalite and iolite. The number seven is associated with violet. Violet stones relate to spiritual truth, higher consciousness, all of those things. And examples are amethyst, but also garnet or purple ruby. And those are the ones that I mentioned in red stones, but they both of those options can definitely lean more red or more purple when you see them in person. The number eight is associated with pink. Pink stones are stimulating and energizing. And they are all about enabling progress. Examples are rose barrel, rose quartz is a popular one. Um, anything in that like sort of light pinky family. The number nine is actually clear. And clear stones symbolize pure energy. That's nurturing, loving, and you know, ultimately successful, but very clear and pure. And examples are clear quartz and diamond. And then getting into the master numbers, the number 11 is associated with silver. And silver stones are peaceful and gentle, but also possess great power and provide enormous potential. And hematite would be the example for a silver stone. And the number 22 is, of course, associated with gold. And gold is used for, you know, aiming high and sun energy and knowing no limits. And examples are, of course, pyrite, uh, which is known as fool's gold, but also tiger's eye. Tiger's eye is, um, has some golden hues in there. So that is a great way to use gemstones, use gemstone jewelry, and pick something in a color family that's related to what your intention is going to be for wearing it. And we've talked about color correspondences on this podcast before, so especially in like the candle episode. So I don't think any of those will be a surprise to you. But you can also, you know, just use your birthstone or anything like that. And naturally, we want to talk about cleansing and consecrating your new tools. Just as in most things that become part of your magical practice, you have to cleanse and charge your talisman and amulets that you buy from someplace, like a gemstone or metal or something like that. Generally, you do not want to cleanse a charm because, again, the charms are lucky. So like a four-leaf clover or a lucky penny that you found uh, – you don't want to take away that luck, so you're not trying to cleanse it. You just want to charge it with your own energy to make it yours and make it connect with you, but don't have to cleanse it. We have lots of you know, different talks on cleansing rituals um, on this podcast, lots of different ways to do that, and I think everybody has their own preferred method. 
So those would, again, would all work with your talisman or amulets. And in the same way that you do it with crystals or gemstones, you can make it as simple or as complicated as you want. You can definitely write a full ritual for cleansing and consecrating, um, but you don't have to. You can also just put it out in moonlight. And then once it is cleansed, you definitely want to imbue that talisman or amulet with the intent, the specific intent that you have for it, and either set it on your altar or someplace um, that is sacred to you, and then come back and feed that amulet with your intention for a total of seven days. And then you can, you know, wear it, bury it, uh, place it on your desk or in your car, whatever its intended purpose is. And that would be just one way to sort of imbue that energy in there and then be able to have that continue, continually working for you, whatever space that you uh, put it out in um, that also connects with your own personal energy. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is, of course, what I have in my own home, my own personal practice that I use as uh, any one of the above. So for amulets that are you know, generally protective, I have a tiger's eye that I just keep in my car. I've mentioned that before, that that's just a very simple way that I have, you know, it's daily practice going on um, with that eye, consecrated that with this intention of protection and place it in the car because that is, uh, tiger's eye is associated with protection and travel. So that is one way that I use a gemstone. And in general, I am a big fan of using gemstones. I've talked about that before. I have lots of crystals and I'd like to collect them. And it's definitely an overrun collection at this point I'm working on it. Uh, but I like to charge those crystals with um, the specific intention that I have for them and keep those um, you know, as, as protection and um, other reasons around the house, like definitely protection around the house, but also use citrine to, you know, help my plant grow and things like that. So I am definitely a fan of the gemstones, but, uh, there are other ways that we use these in or, or around our home. I know my, I've mentioned before that my husband doesn't practice witchcraft. He's actually still Catholic. So he has, and he's a firefighter. So he has the various religious medals for his correct patron saint and all of the things like that, that have been consecrated by a priest that he keeps for protection in his car and in his locker at work and things like that. So it's definitely not a sort of witchcraft only thing. You can definitely have the religious aspects to it. So we use those as well. And he has his own, you know, sort of like lucky, lucky things, lucky ideas, like his, you know, lucky Blackhawk shirt to wear is to make sure the Blackhawks win and, and things like that. Um, so a lot of people do have those things without it being associated with, with witchcraft. Um, I don't particularly have any um, lucky charms. I did when I was in high school. I had this like little pink, I don't even know what it was. It's just like a little like character and it had like all these little plastic spikies on him. I don't know. It was this tiny thing, like the size of my thumb, this little pink puff ball. And for some reason, I don't know how I decided it was lucky or why I started carrying it, but I started taking it to all of the standardized tests you have to do when you're a senior in high school, like the SAT and ACT and all of the AP classes and all those like nonsense tests that you have to take for college. Um, I started carrying that little thing with me into every single one of these tests and they all went well. So I like considered it lucky and just kept, kept carrying it. So that was my little lucky charm back then. Uh, I don't have any that I carry with me now, but I think I love hearing other people's lucky charms and I love um, seeing them when people carry them in their wallets and things like that. So if you have any lucky charms that you keep with you, keep near you. I definitely would love to see them and know the story behind them. Uh, tag me on Instagram and, and share that, what your different variations are. Obviously, they don't have to be gemstones or anything particularly witchy. They absolutely could be clothes or little pink puffballs, <laughs> figurines, um, anything like that. So if you have anything like that, definitely um, share. And if you use any amulets or talisman, I would love to see those too. But that is all I have for you this week on charms, amulets, and talisman. 
Again, reach out on Instagram, which Wednesday's podcast. If you want to share any of yours, I definitely love to hear it. And every week we have a chat going over on Discord related to that week's episode. So I will definitely be asking the same question over there. So if you have not joined the Discord community, it is a great place to be. And that is always linked on whichwednesdays.com or over on Instagram that you can find the link to join that. And I will see you next week for a fun episode on even more book recommendations because I have even more to share and I feel like that's at least the third, um, maybe fourth episode that I've had on just books, but there's so many good ones out there and so many new ones have come out. So more next week on books. See you then. Need even more witchcraft? Subscribe to Patreon for exclusive bonus content three times a week and order Sabbath boxes and other supplies at witchwednesdays.com. Be sure to follow on Instagram at witchwednesdays podcast.